Everything you need to know about Assassin's Creed Simplified, part one. For new players, getting into this franchise can be really daunting. With over a dozen games spanning over two decades, I don't blame you. Hopefully this video will help you get into these games easier, because trust me guys, it's worth it. So let's start way back at the beginning with the Isu race. I know that this seems complicated from the get-go, but it's not that bad, trust me. Before humans, there were the Isu, an advanced civilization that actually created the humans. For slavery. They created this technology called the Pieces of Eden that they would use to control the minds of humans to make them perfect slaves. We will talk about these puppies in another video. Long story short, they knew of a solar flare that was going to be coming soon that would wipe out the entire Earth. They tried to make a shield that would protect the Earth from the solar flare, but they weren't able to make it in time. The earth was destroyed, barely any humans remained, and even less east. The only thing they could accomplish is leaving messages to the people of the future to help them protect from the next solar flare. You may be wondering, how the heck did they leave these messages? Behold, the Animus. The Animus is a piece of modern human technology that you can go back into your ancestors' memory. It scans your DNA and allows you to basically relive your ancestors' lives. The Animus went through some crazy phases through the game. It started out as a desk, then turned into a really comfy looking chair. Turn into just like a gaming setup at one point. Turn into a VR. And we don't really like to talk about this. The Isu had tech that they could run probabilities of what the future would look like. And like I said, before they died, they left messages. The most probable way to save the future was with this guy. And they found that the best way to get to that guy was to talk through his ancestors to him. Something to note, Assassin's Creed as a franchise really likes history. Of course, they add things like the Isu and the Animus and the Assassins and the Templars, but for the most part, it's historically accurate. But let's start with explaining the Assassins. Both the Assassins and the Templars are basically secret organizations that exist. And their goal is peace, both of them. They both want peace. But the means of that peace is different. Assassins want peace through freedom, where Templars want peace through order. And the Templars through history seem to have a huge upper hand. And that's where assassins get their name. They go and assassinate people that have way too much power. The Templars in the modern day disguise themselves as Abstergo Industry. They're the ones that made the Animus tech. And in part four, we'll talk about what those power hungry suckers are after. So the pieces of Eden are made by the Isu and they're essentially tools that have a lot of different purposes. There's the apples of Eden, there's a bunch of them. There's a sword of Eden. There's this glass thingy. There's a bunch of others, but basically they all serve different purposes and there's a bunch of them. Now these pieces of Eden were never meant for humans. They were tools for the Isu to use. And specifically the apples were meant to help slave humanity. And if humans get a hold of these, they can take over the minds of other humans and make them do whatever they want. So remember what we said about the Templars? They want control. And what better way to control people than taking over their mind? The ancient assassins knowing this hid all the pieces of Eden they could. So the Templars created the Animus to dive back into the memories of those assassins and find the pieces of Eden. So if you guys remember, the Earth was once destroyed a long time ago by a giant solar flare. And the Isu knew that this solar flare was doomed to happen again. And the Isu had tech to basically look into the future and see the probabilities of saving the future and it had to do with Desmond Miles. So Desmond Miles is the main character that you play as through the first five games. He was born into the Creed, but he left it when he reached adulthood. The Templars knew he had really important lineage in his DNA, and that he had multiple ancestors that knew where the pieces of Eden were. So the modern day Templars known as Abstergo kidnapped him and made him use the Animus so that they could find the pieces of Eden. Picking up where we left off, Abstergo Industries, the modern day Templars, kidnapped Desmond Miles to use his memories of his ancestors to find the pieces of Eden. Desmond goes into the Animus and relives the lives of Ezio and Altair. Something to note, the Animus has something called the bleeding effect. So Desmond going back and living the lives of these two, he not only takes in their memories, but also their abilities. Through the memories of Ezio and Altair, he learns of the eternal struggle of the Assassin's Creed and the Templar Order. But he learns something even bigger than that. He learns of the Isu race and that they left messages for him specifically through the memories of Ezio and Altair. They essentially broke the fourth wall to Desmond, speaking directly to him in the Animus. Desmond learns from the Isu what it will take to save the world, and it's a doozy. Warning, part seven and beyond will contain heavy spoilers, so if you don't mind that, I'll see you there. So when we left off, Abstergo Industries captures Desmond Miles. He relives the lives of Altair and Ezio and learns that the Isu, an ancient race, have been leaving messages for him specifically, telling him about the end of the world and that it's gonna end from a giant solar flare just like it did forever ago. Ah! And the end of the world is only 50 days away, so he has to get his ass out of there. 
While living the life of Ezio, he learns of the location that he needs to go to an ancient Isu temple to activate a device that puts a shield around the earth. This shield was ancient tech made by the Isu, but never activated, and I'll tell you why later. Desmond, with the help of the assassins, gets out of Abstergo and makes it to the east coast of America to the ancient Isu temple. But when they get there, they find an ancient force field that's blocking the mechanism to turn on the shield. This is where an ancient Isu named Juno comes into play. Juno's spirit is trapped within this temple and is appearing to them in the form of a hologram. Juno explains that there's an ancient Isu key that unlocks that gate and the last person to have it is one of Desmond's ancestors, Connor. Connor is half native, half British, and his real name is Ratulagetum, I think if I said that right. He's my favorite assassin. You guys should just play this game, but anyways, let's keep going. Desmond relives the life of Connor just like he did Ezio and Altair and finds where he put that key. <laughs> I'm really oversimplifying this. It sounds cheesy, but it's not. I'm just trying to be really basic. Desmond gets the key, comes back, unlocks the gate, and Juno shows him the thing that he needs to put his hand on to activate the shield. Home stretch. But then who comes along but Minerva? Minerva was the one that was leaving messages to Ezio for Desmond. Minerva explains that Juno is trapped in this temple for a reason. She is evil. Minerva explains that after the human Isu war, they tried to live in peace, but Juno wanted to destroy all the humans. Juno had interlaced her spirit into the shield system, so when activated, she would be released. This is why they did not activate the shields the first time. So Desmond has a very hard decision. Let the world burn and don't let Juno out, or let the shield go around the earth, but also release Juno in the process. I wish I could finish all this in this video, but I need to make another one about the ending of this game. A lot of you probably know, the Assassin's Creed fans are really split down the middle, and a big reason is because of what happens after the events of this game. So in the next video, I'm going to explain what happens at the end of this game and following, and then after that, we're going to be talking about the new generation of Assassin's Creed. Huge thanks to those who have made it this far in this series. I really hope you guys enjoy this content. If you do, please leave a like and comment. It helps show this video to people that want to see it. Be sure to watch to the end as well because we're going to be talking about why there's a huge rift in the Assassin's Creed fan base. So where we left off, Desmond has a decision to make. If he activates the shield to protect the Earth, he releases Juno. Juno wants to destroy the human race. If he decides not to activate the shield, the solar flare will destroy the Earth just like it did a long time ago. But there's an extra caveat that they failed to mention before. Juno explains that if he uses the shield and activates it, he will die. So if he decides to save humanity and activate the shield, he will sacrifice himself in the process. Desmond explains that he believes there's more hope for humanity surviving with Juno released than there would be with the solar flare destroying the entire world. So with that, Desmond decides to make the ultimate sacrifice and activate the shield. The world shield is released, protecting it from the deadly solar flare. And not only does this end up killing Desmond, but by doing so, releasing Juno to wreak havoc upon the world. Now, that is where Assassin's Creed 3 ends. The biggest cliffhanger ever. So naturally, me and all the other fans back when this game came out were like, the next game must be like a modern Assassin's Creed game where you're trying to defend the world from Juno and like take her out or something, right? Like modern day. This is where shiz hits the fan, my friends. So not only do we not get a modern day Assassin's Creed, not only for the next four games do they tease us about what is happening in the modern day with Juno, but they decide to kill off Juno in a comic book. So essentially what happens is Juno is released from her prison, but she doesn't have a body. Her spirit basically takes over the internet and she exists kind of like within the world's internet system. Her group of cult followers end up making her like a clone body. And the moment that she gets into that body, she is killed by a random assassin that is newly introduced in this comic book, which by the way, nobody reads. So I want you to imagine something for me. Imagine Thanos at the end of Infinity War, right? He wins the battle. Imagine that they finally win and kill him off, not in a movie, but in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. TV show. That's essentially what happens in Assassin's Creed. They take the biggest plot point, the biggest bad guy of their entire series, and instead of finishing her off in the game, they do it in a comic book. I personally believe they did this 100% for a cash grab so that they could keep making games. So in the next part, I will explain what's happening in the modern day now. What is going on in the modern day story 
of these new Assassin's Creed games. So in this video, let's start with the basics. With the modern day in these three games, they essentially rebooted the modern day. Everything that was canon is still canon, but what I mean is they basically got a new antagonist and they made the world coming to an end again. And our new protagonist that we play as in the modern day, replacing Desmond, is Layla Hassan. Layla Hassan worked for Abstergo, the modern day Templar. She did not know that they are the modern day Templar. She specifically is a scientist with the Animus Project. She loves the Animus Project and she wanted to make it better. While working for Abstergo, Layla found a way to get DNA from people that were not her own ancestors and be able to visit their memories in the Animus. This was not a thing before. Before you had to get somebody of the lineage of the person you're trying to visit the memories of. So this was really cool. Layla was sent by Abstergo on a mission to find an ancient artifact in Egypt to bring back for them. On this mission, she kind of went rogue and began testing on her new Animus by herself. Layla was able to extract DNA from Bayek of Siwa's mummy and go back and learn of the dawn of the Assassin's Creed. When Abstergo found out, they were not happy and sent agents after her to kill her. So at the end of Assassin's Creed Origins, Layla is visited by William Miles. None other than the father of Desmond Miles. He's also the leader of the entire Assassin's Creed in the modern day. With Layla in trouble with Abstergo, or the Templars, William invites her to join his side. And remind you, Layla does not know about Abstergo being the Templars until now, and she's neither a Templar or Assassin. But with no other choice, she ends up going with William Miles. William is on a quest to find this piece of Eden, the Staff of Hermes, before the Templars find it. The staff has a ton of powers, including immortality upon the bestowal, regeneration of healing, sustenance bestowal, physical empowerment, and energy manipulations, there's a bunch of other. William knows the last person to know where this staff was, and he needs Layla's help to go through her memory. And that ancestor is Cassandra, or Alexio. So Layla has officially joined William Miles in his hunt to find the staff of Hermes, before the Templars do. And like previous games, Layla has to go into the memories of Cassandra, who used to live in ancient Greece, to find out what happened to the staff of Hermes. Something to note here really quick, apparently now gods like Poseidon and Zeus and Odin are actually just Isu people that humans turn into myth. Long story short, Cassandra ends up finding the lost city of Atlantis and finds Pythagoras wielding the staff of Hermes. By wielding the staff, he is immortal and he passes the staff on to Cassandra and dies. So Layla exits the Animus, finds the entrance to Atlantis, and finds none other than Cassandra herself over 2,000 years later still wielding this thing. Cassandra explains that Layla's more important than she thinks and that she's actually the heir to wielding the Staff of Hermes. Cassandra passes the staff on and ends up floating away like pixie dust. Let's talk about Layla and the trials of Aletheia. So Layla now learns that she is something called the Heir of Memories and she is tasked to wield the Staff of Hermes. Being the wielder of this staff comes with a lot of responsibility. And plot twist! There's an ancient Isu person trapped inside this staff named Aletheia. In this game, it's unclear if she's trapped in a bad way like Juno, how she was imprisoned. She's not really imprisoned. Her soul is kind of just in this staff. Aletheia explains to Layla that she needs to perform a series of trials to prevent herself from being corrupted by the power of the staff. Cassandra had already completed these trials being the previous heir of memories, so she just went in the Animus and experienced them as Cassandra. Before she can complete the trials, she kind of goes nuts. She kills a bunch of Abstergo agents, and even straight up murders her best friend. By the way, Layla is a part of the Creed now, and the person she killed was also part of the Creed. The Assassins did not like this. Finally, let's talk about the modern day in Assassin's Creed Valhalla! So, some time has passed here. Layla is a hot mess. She killed her nurse friend and went nuts with the staff, and now she's smoking and taking a ton of pills, and she looks like a greasy slob. She has officially placed the staff of Hermes in a protective case so she doesn't use it and go bonkers. We're not entirely sure what happened to her with the whole Creed killing that one lady, but now she's with Sean and Rebecca from the old Assassin's Creed games. I don't know if they took her under their wing or if they were assigned to her, I don't know. But yet again, the end of the world is not. This time it's no solar flare, it's the Earth destroying itself. So apparently when Desmond saved the world by activating the world shield, it was never turned off, and so the shield has been getting stronger and stronger, and it's going to end humanity if it doesn't slow down. The world shield is going to end humanity, and the assassins need to figure out how to stop it. The assassins, specifically Sean and Rebecca, receive a strange message from a strange source. The message is cool. I'm going to read it. It says, I lived, I died, and now I sleep. And in my sleep, I dream. And in my dreams, I see an end to the doom that will grip the earth once again. Find the wolf kissed. Find the mad one. Find me and save us all from another death. This message included coordinates to a random grave in North America of an ancient Viking. So Sean and Rebecca need the help of Layla to go back into the memories of this Viking and basically solve the riddle of this message and find the person that needs to be found. 
The Animus gets confused at the DNA of the skeleton and it can't decide if it's female or male. So in order to solve that weird message, Layla has to go back and relive the memories of Eivor. But like I said, the Animus can't decide if Eivor was a male or a female. And that's because Eivor was a female. But Odin is a male. What? So like I said in previous videos, the gods like Odin, Zeus, Poseidon are actually just ancient Isu. And all of them died with the first solar flare. But Odin and many others found a way to preserve their spirits through reincarnation of other humans. The reincarnation isn't perfect though. Odin has to share basically the conscience of Eivor in one body. Which personality is control is not always perfect, so in Odin's case, he was not in control of Eivor. So like I said, Odin is forced to share a conscience with Eivor, who's actually a female. This is a male version, but blah. So Odin does not have control over Eivor's body and kind of just exists in her mind. Remember, Odin is an Isu, and him and a bunch of other friends found a way to preserve their essence in the reincarnation of humans in the future. So Odin, Thor, Loki, all these guys were just Isu, and they were reincarnated in the future, that future being the Viking era. The Isu actually were not one people, they were split into a lot of factions. And so you know from the old games that some Isu tried to make a shield around the world, but other Isu did not attempt this. So this group of Isu decided to not try to save the world, but save themselves. They essentially did this by uploading their essence into like an ancient Isu artifact being the world tree and being born again through human. Let's talk about Loki and the Sage program in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So in AC Valhalla, Eivor has visions of Asgard. These visions are actually memories of Odin that exist within Eivor. These memories aren't actually of Asgard, but of the Isu. Odin just finds that it's easier to explain all this to Eivor, kind of through her own mythology and beliefs. So basically everything that happens in this Asgard story is just an Isu story, translated. There's a lot that happens in these memories, but one of the main ones is the conflicts that happen between Loki and Odin. Loki secretly has a child with somebody of a lower Isu class. When Odin finds out of the secret child, he wants to kill the child, but then he swears not to. Long story short, there's a lot of feuding that happens between these two. And so when the end of the world hits, Loki is not invited to take part of the Sage program. So as I explained in the last video, Loki and Odin have so much beef that Odin does not invite Loki to basically survive via the Sage program. So remember, there's a lot of factions of Isu. One faction tried to make a shield around the earth. This faction of Isu tried to save themselves via the Sage program. Essentially, they upload their DNA and their essence into the world tree. And by doing so, they are reincarnated via humanity sometime in the future, after the apocalypse. After Odin and his friends upload their essence into the Sage program, Loki sneaks in and kills Heimdall before he can leave and takes his place. And so Loki was able to upload his essence into the Sage program. And Loki is then reincarnated as Basim, the assassin. And Loki is out to find Odin in the reincarnated state and kill him. Let's talk about the World Tree and Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Think of the World Tree as like a network that exists within the Earth. It's very advanced technology and grants a lot of powers and abilities to whoever's a part of it. The World Tree is actually where Juno existed after being released from her prison after Assassin's Creed 3 while she waited for her followers to make her a physical body. The Sage Tree was built with these hookups, so if the Sage program did not work very well, the person could come and hook up to the World Tree and exist within it. And we know from the game that the Sage program did not work very well for Odin and Tyr. Odin was at odds with Eivor all the time. Whereas for Loki, it worked almost perfectly. Actually, we don't even know if Basim is still in this body. With the Sage program not going very well, Tyr leads Sigurd and Eivor to the World Tree. And without knowing any better, Sigurd and Eivor get hooked up to the World Tree. Loki ends up following them and plans to kill Odin. Let's talk about the fight between Odin and Eivor. So Eivor and Sigurd are now hooked up to the Life Tree. Odin and Tyr led them here to get hooked up to this thing because the Sage program was not going very well for them. And they'd much rather live within the tree than in these bodies. Now, Eivor and Sigurd are not dead. They live basically within a simulation of this tree. Not knowing what the life tree is, they wake up to what seems like Valhalla, heaven. Valhalla seems amazing at first, but Eivor begins to catch on that everything is not real. Eivor eventually convinces Sigurd that this is not truly Valhalla and they need to get out. When Eivor tries to wake up and leave, Odin stops him. If Eivor is able to leave, Odin has to keep living within his stupid body where they're at odds all the time. What continues is a fight scene between Odin and Eivor when it's really all just in his mind. Eivor ends up winning by not fighting against Odin, and Eivor is able to leave the simulation. Eivor wakes up to Basim holding Sigurd by a knife. Remember, Basim is Loki and Sigurd is Tyr. 
Basm has been on the hunt for Odin, and he thinks that Sigurd is the reincarnated Odin, when really, he's Tyr. Basm and Eivor start to fight, and Basm realizes that Odin is actually Eivor. Basm never suspected Eivor to be Odin because, remember, Eivor is a female. Basm did not think that that could happen. Eivor ends up winning the battle by connecting Basm to the World Tree simulation. This is where Basm will remain for over a thousand years. But if you think we're rid of him, we're not. Layla wakes up from the Animus and knows what she has to do to save the world. And from within the World Tree, she will have the ability to slow down the Earth Shield and prevent it from destroying the world. And as you can see, the World Tree is like in critical meltdown from having the World Shield activated for eight years. So Layla goes and gets hooked up to the tree, and you see who's next to her? In the World Tree, she meets Basm. Basm explains that for the past thousand years, he has been in the World Tree running calculations on how to save the end of the world. And he reveals that he is the one that sent that cryptic message in the beginning to Layla. When he said, find the mad one, find the wolf kissed, find me, the mad one is Odin, the wolf kissed is Eivor, and he is Basm. Basm reveals that his calculations showed Layla coming to the world tree and activating this thing. So think of Basm kind of like Doctor Strange in Marvel. From within the world tree, he's had the ability to run calculations of every possible timeline, and that he has interfered in every way he can to lead Layla to this moment. Layla has to activate this thing to slow down the world shield, just like Desmond had to activate this to start the world shield. But instead of activating with her physical body, she's technically doing it with her mind from within the world tree itself. Layla ends up activating this thing and slows down the world shield, and you can see who's a little too happy behind her that she did this. Remember, Basm is Loki, and Loki is a master trickster. We'll talk about what happens to Loki in another video. Layla successfully slows down the Earth's shield and saves the world. After doing so, she sees this giant tree, and she is greeted by somebody named the Reader. And if you listen closely, you'll recognize that the Reader is none other than Desmond Miles. So when Desmond sacrificed himself at the end of the third game, his physical body died, but his spirit was brought into the world tree which technically means he was in there with Juno for a time. He explains that since entering the world tree, he has found out that the solar flare is doomed to happen again. He may have saved the world at one time, but they aren't out of the woods yet. This tree that he has been studying is not a tree at all, but actual possible timelines in the future. And every little node at the end of each branch represents the apocalypse. Every possible outcome that he has calculated leads to the end of the world still. So Layla learns from the reader that the end of the world is unavoidable and that Desmond and Layla's sacrifice just slowed down the apocalypse. Layla wants to help when she leaves the world tree, but the reader explains that her body has been exposed to so much radiation being down here that she's dead. Layla says that because she has the Staff of Hermes, she can't die, but the reader explains that she dropped it when she entered the world tree. Layla, accepting her fate, decides to stay here with the reader, Desmond, and become another reader. And she's determined to help the reader find a solution to save the world. There's also a lot of symbolism here to the early games, Adam, Eve, and the Tree of Life. Layla recommends to Desmond that they look at realities where the solar flare does hit and humanity survive, and that there might be hope within those scenarios. As you can see, Basm, or Loki, was a little too happy about Layla saving the world by slowing down the Earth shield. After this moment, Basm ends up leaving the world tree. Now, as you probably assumed, Basm is long dead. His body's like a zombie now. But when Basm fell, he landed on the staff of Hermes. The staff ends up reviving his long dead corpse. And after a thousand years of being dead, Basm is back and stronger than ever. You may be thinking, what are the odds of him miraculously landing on the staff of Hermes? Remember, he had the ability to run every calculation imaginable from within the world tree. He knew that if all of this happened the way he wanted to, he would land on the staff of Hermes. Basm suddenly starts speaking to the staff and he asks, are you with me? And Aletheia responds asking, is the mad one here? Remember that we learned in Odyssey that the spirit of Aletheia lives within this staff. It turns out that Aletheia was Loki's lover back when the Isu were still alive. It seems like this was Loki's plan all along, not to just come back in the modern world, but to be reunited with his love, Aletheia. I'm assuming that later they're gonna try to get her a body again so she's not in a staff, but I guess we'll see in AC Mirage. Basm ends up going back to Layla's base and meets Sean and Rebecca. These two obviously know who Basm is and were shocked that he's alive and that Layla's gone. Basm was able to convince them that he is actually on their side. 
He did this through an audio recording left by Layla explaining what happens. We don't know if this recording is real or fake, but it's there. Basim ends up making a request to meet William Miles, the head of the Creed. And while he waits, he's gonna hop in the Animus and see what happens in the end to Odin and Eivor. All that really happens here is Eivor ends up heading to America by Odin's request and she kind of just ends up picking his brain and learning from his wisdoms. While Basim is in the Animus, William Miles pulls a baller move and meets him face to face within the Animus. The assassins aren't sure what Basim's plan is and if he's good or bad, so they're making sure they're safe. Basim explains that he's an assassin and that he's on their side. And that as a brotherhood, they are far behind what the brotherhood used to be and they have a lot to learn. William makes a request and asks for some of Basim's blood so that they can hop in the Animus and relive Basim's life. The Assassin's story will continue in Assassin's Creed Mirage.